the United Kingdom. As an international student, really, your journey in the United Kingdom can be both exciting and challenging at the same time. And there are many things to consider from finding the right university to navigate to the new culture and the new environment there. So as well in this space, we'll cover the key aspect of studying, working, and living in the United Kingdom and offer tips and experience for those that are from those that have been living there, what are the things that they have that they are experiencing and how they are able to navigate it. So the UK is actually home to some of the worst top universities and as an international student we have a wealth of options to choose from and before you apply it is important to do your comprehensive research about the universities and courses that will be best for you so the coding factors that you can consider when you are researching for universities and courses that fit you in the United Kingdom are the location location is quite important then number two the cost if you are to self-fund yourself, the cost also is very important. The reputation of the university, you can consider that too if you are funding yourself. And the content of the course that you want to do, you have to check if the course content also aligns with your goals and what you want to achieve in the future. So it will be easier for you to explain to anyone that asks you that why the United Kingdom. So like I've mentioned, reputation, the, the factors like number one, reputation. So you have to look for university with a strong reputation for the course that you want to study. Like universities in the United Kingdom, they, they have specified area, they have area where they, they are strong. Like I know University of Stalin is strong in some agricultural courses. There are even some universities that are just based on the course that you want to study. Like uh, there's one London schools of hygiene and something like that. So if that's what you want to study, that would be the best school for you to go to. So the reputation of the school, you have to look at it. Look for university with a strong reputation for the course that you want to study. Check the university rankings, the links of the tables to have the idea of how well the university performs academically. Then number two, location. Consider the location of the university is proximity to the city center and its access to public transportation. And you can think about whether you prefer to study in a bustling city, a large city, or a quiet town. So when considering in, uh, universities in the UK, location can be an important factor to consider. Living in a city like London, for example, can of offer exciting opportunities and experience, but it can also be expensive. So the cost of living in London can be higher, particularly when it comes to accommodations and food. So however, there are many other cities and towns in the United Kingdom that offers a great student experience at a lower cost. For example, cities such as uh, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, over vibrant student communities, excellent universities, and lower living costs compared to their counterparts in London. So these cities are home to a range of cultural attractions, restaurants, and even good nightlife for those that enjoy entertainment. So making them a great choice for students looking for aff affordable and exciting place to live and at the same time, study. So in addition to these cities, there are also many smaller towns and rural areas in the UK that offer aff affordable, even more affordable living options. Places such as Dundee or Canterbury, they offer a relaxed place of living and lower cost of life. So ultimately, the location that you choose will depend on your personal preferences, your budgets, and your academic goals. So when considering a location, it's important to research the cost of living factors, the cost of living in that area for you to make your decision. So by choosing a location that offers an affordable living option, you can ensure that you will enjoy your student experience without the financial stress. Then number three is fees and funding. So consider the cost of tuition fees, accommodation and living expenses. Check if the university offers any scholarship or financial aid that you can apply to as an international student. Number four, student support. Look for universities that pro provide a range of student support, student service for international students, such as orientation programs, academic support, and career guidance. guidance. So when you finish your program of choice, you know that you finish in a university that has already guided you in your career trajectory. So number five is campus facilities. Consider the quality and the 
the quality of the university's facilities, such as their libraries, their laboratories, their sports centers. If the course that you want to do is research based, you should look for a university that has a good laboratory that you can work in. Then number six, the last one, under my factors that you can put at the back of your mind when you're choosing the university is diversity and inclusivity. So you look for a university that have a diverse young population and promote inclusivity and equality or something of sort. So you check the university that has a student-led societies or clubs and something like that. Then after you've been able to identify the university of your choice based on the factors that I've mentioned and then the documents that you need to apply for your application. So the exact documents required to apply for admission in the United Kingdom will vary depending on the university and the course that you are applying for. So however, there are, these are some common, common documents that you need to have. Number one is your academic transcript is very important. So your academic transcript is the official records of your academic achievement from your university that you graduated from. If you are paying for an undergraduate admission, that means you have to connect your high school certificate to high school result and others. The number two, English proficiency test results. So if English is not your first language, definitely you need to prove your ability to speak English by writing IETS or TOEFL. And if you are going to the United Kingdom, they usually recognize IETS because it is conducted by the British Council. So if English is not your first language, you may need to provide an evidence of your language proficiency through an improved English test, which is IETS or TOEFL. But in most cases in the United Kingdom, if you are from a country where English is spoken as the first language, English was a medium of communication in your university, then you might not need to submit IETS or TOEFL. But even at that, there are some universities that doesn't even actually care about whether your primary or your secondary or even your university education is in English. As long as you're an international student, you have to provide IETS. So if you know that you don't have IETS and you can't write it and the school doesn't allow you to submit a waiver, an English waiver letter, then you know that you might not be, you might not be able to submit an application to that university. So you have to find out that university. University like University of Edinburgh, you definitely have to submit IETS as an international student. So that's the number two thing that you need to have among the documents. Number three, personal statements. A statement of purpose is a written statement that outlines your academic achievements, your career aspirations, and the reason why you are applying to the course of study. Number four, let letter of recommendation. So these are the letters from your teachers, your professors, your employers, anyone that can vouch for your academic abilities, personal qualities. So when you are choosing someone for your letter of recommendation, it is not advisable to choose a family member, no. And since you are applying for admission, a lot of universities prefer an academic reference. But if you tried enough or you've graduated from the university for a long time and you cannot find an academic reference, you can also use a professional reference, an employer of yours that can speak well to your ability and mostly your academic abilities that you are capable of doing such thing when you get to the university. So number five is your passport or your national identity. Your international passport is very important. You definitely need to provide the proof of your identity and citizenship. So you don't have an international passport, you should go and get it. So other additional document that you might need is, but you don't need it for submitting an application, just your visa document and some other document after you've gotten your admissions. So some document that you can think of are writing samples, which it is needed by your by the course that you want to study or some kind of portfolio if you want to do a creative arts course so you have some drawings some things that you can show to prove that okay you have an experience in that field so you have portfolios or some writing samples it might be you might also use it and then We'll talk a little bit about scholarships in the United Kingdom. There are many scholarships available for international students studying in the UK. And the availability and criteria for this scholarship can vary depending on the university, obviously, the course that you're studying, and also the country of origin. There are a lot of universities that are just available for specific uh, students from a certain country. So your country of origin can determine the type of scholarship that might. You might be qualified for within a university. 
So the most common scholarship in the United Kingdom are the Shevney Scholarship. The Shevney Scholarship is usually open during uh, August. The last year opened 2nd of August and it closed by 2nd of November. So hopefully this year all will open and close during that same time. So the Shevney Scholarship is a UK government scholarship that offers fully funded awards to our starting international student with leadership potential. So they favor students with good leadership potentials. Yeah, the scholarship covers your tuition fees, your living expenses, your travel costs. The number two is Commonwealth Scholarship. Under Commonwealth Scholarship, they have a lot of scholarship. There is Commonwealth Master Scholarship, which is the most common world. Commonwealth Chef Scholarship, Commonwealth Master Scholarship. There is Commonwealth Split Scholarship for PhD. There is Commonwealth Distance Learning Scholarship. You don't have, you can go to the United Kingdom versus Distance Learning. You just have to do it online from your country. There's Commonwealth PhD scholarship, so they have a lot. But the most common one is the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship. So it is also a fully funded scholarship by the UK government and is only available to citizens of the Commonwealth countries who want to apply to study masters in the United Kingdom. So the living expenses, the tuition fees, everything else that is covered. Number three, you have the Rose Scholarship. It's also a prestigious scholarship for assigning students from selected countries around the world. You came to study at University of Oxford. So the scholarship covers tuition, living expenses, and travel costs. The Gates Cambridge Scholarship is number four. It's also awarded to outstanding international students. I want to pursue postgraduate study in the University of Cambridge, and it covers all your tuition fees as well. The number five is the British Council scholarship i just posted a video about that about the great scholarship in the united kingdom let me attach it to this page so you can have access to it and also i have a list of ongoing scholarship in the uk like how many of them uh -huh. 11 ongoing scholarships in the uk let me attach it as well so if you haven't seen it before, check it out. I'm going to see some scholarships that you can apply to in the United Kingdom from that list. Most of them are still ongoing. You apply to them if you haven't, as long as you are qualified. So then that's the scholarship. And from me, it's just a few, just a small proportion of the scholarship in the United Kingdom. There are a lot of other scholarships within the university. I can apply to you, I will qualify to. So you just have to check the financial aid page of the university to see if there are other scholarships within that university that you can apply to as an international student. But these are just the common ones. And this ones, they, for example, the Shevlin Scholarship and the Commonwealth Scholarship, they have some kind of clause to them, whereby you have to return to your own country after the completion of your program of your one year master's course. You have to return to your home country and stay there before you can go. So they want you to implement what you've learned from the university to your home country. That's why it is mandated that you have to return. And then a little bit about self-funding. The cost of studying, for example, a one-year master's program in the United Kingdom can vary depending on the university, the cost, and the location. However, I have a rough estimate of how much it can cost you, for example, a tuition fee, the tuition fee for a one year master's program in the United Kingdom can range from twelve thousand pounds to over thirty thousand pounds depending on the course and the university. A business or management program at a prestigious university such as the University of Oxford or University of Cambridge will cost over thirty thousand pounds. While a less specialized course at a smaller university it could cost just around twelve thousand to fifteen thousand pounds. So it depends on the course and the university that you're applying to. That will determine that will be the determining factor of the tuition fee that you pay. And number two factor for self funding is accommodation. Accommodation costs in the UK can vary depending on the location and the type of accommodation as well. So in general, you can expect to pay around five hundred to a thousand pounds per month for a room in a shared student accommodation, or around one thousand pounds, one thousand five hundred pounds per month in an apartment. While some university offers like on campus accommodation, we can it can be cheaper than private options. Then living expenses in general 
it depends on you. It's it's personal. And the things that that you can incur money or you are just food, transportation, and your entertainment as well. And you can they can vary depending on your lifestyle and the location that you are. So a rough estimate will just be around eight hundred to twelve hundred pounds per month to cover your expenses. So you may need to budget around twenty thousand pounds to forty thousand pounds to cover your tuition fees, accommodation, living expenses for a one year master's course in the UK. But like I said, it can vary greatly depending on your specific circumstances, the choice of the accommodation and the lifestyle that you have, the universities that you want to study, the location of that university is another. So you should also know that many universities in the United Kingdom offer installment payments whereby they make it easier for students to manage their cost of tuition. So these payment plans allow you to pay your tuition fee in several smaller payments rather than just one large sum up front. And it can be particularly helpful for you as an international student. So you might consider that kind of option. So this university that has a, an extended instrument payment work. So it can vary depending on the university. So it's why it's important to check the university requirement before you submit an application. So many universities in the United Kingdom require international students to pay a deposit fee before they can issue a document called CAS, which is confirmation of acceptance for studies. So your CAS is required to apply for a student's visa and this deposit serves as a guarantee that you are serious about studying at the university and you begin to attend the course. So the amount that of deposit can vary depending on the university and the cost of study, but it is usually a percentage of your total tuition fees. So for example, some university may require a deposit of 10% or 20% of your tuition fees. So once the deposit is paid, the university will give you a CAS, which you're going to use to apply for your student's visa. The deposit is usually deducted from the total tuition fee, like I said, once you register in the university. So it's also important to know that Deposit is usually not refundable. So if you decide to, to not attend the university, unless it is in some exceptional circumstances, such as more like visa revisa or serious illness, therefore, it is very, very important to carefully consider your options before you pay the deposit. Because in most cases, it is not refundable. Then the visa application process after you've applied to the university, you've selected university, you've applied, then you've gotten admission, you have to prepare for application process of visa. So visa application process for international students going to the UK can be a little bit complex and require careful planning. But overview of what you need, like I said, you need your class, which is confirmation of acceptance for study. So before you apply for a student visa, you will need a class from the university that you'll be attending. So the CAS is going to have a unique reference number that confirms that you have been accepted on the course of study in the, in the, at the university in the United Kingdom. Then number two also, which is the most important, is your financial evidence, which is also called proof of fund. So you will need to provide financial ev evidence that you have enough money to cover your tuition fees and your living expenses for the duration of your course in the United Kingdom. So the specific amounts required for financial evidence, your proof of funds depending on your circumstances. But to give you a rough estimate, you definitely need to show around more than a thousand pounds per month for living expenses if you are studying in London, or it might be less if you are studying in another part of the United Kingdom that is outside of London. So you need to provide your proof of fund, which is mostly in form of bank statements. Or if you have scholarship, you don't need to provide it. You just have to give them the scholarship letters indicating that, indicating all the amount of money that will be covered in your scholarship. So if there's a deficiency, you might need to, if the scholarship is past year, that means you have to support it with the bank statement. But if scholarship is fully funded, then eh, you don't need to provide it. You just have to give them your scholarship letter to show your financial evidence. So your passport, your 
I eight years and others you need it. And at times tuberculosis uh, tuberculosis test if you are from a country that has tuberculosis, we are tuberculosis prevalent in that country. So these are the documents that you might need for your visa application. So the basic step for applying for a student visa is just to check the visa requirements, get a cash from your choosing university, prepare your documents, apply online, you apply to the government of the United Kingdom web website. And then your biometrics appointment. Once you submit your visa application online, you need to attend a biometric appointment at the visa application center. Then after that, you wait for the decision. If your application is approved, you receive your visa. So generally, after you receive your visa, you just find yourself in the United Kingdom. So working in the United Kingdom, many international students choose to work part-time while studying in the UK just to earn extra money to gain extra and to gain work experience. So as an international student, you are allowed to work up to like 20 hours per week during time, during normal and uh, school time. And you might work full time during other days. So there are a lot of part-time jobs that you can do when you get there. And as of September 2021, the United Kingdom government has they introduced or more like reintroduced the post study work visa, which they call the graduate route. So the post study work visa allow you to be eligible as an international student to work in the UK for up to two years after you've completed your master's studies or even three years if you completed a PhD program. So in summary, actually Working, studying, and living in the UK as an international student can be a rewarding experience. So by researching your option, taking a proactive approach to your education, balance of work and study, and building support network, you can make the best out of your journey to the United Kingdom. So if you have any question, I will open the floor. You can request the mic and ask your question. Question yeah. is... um. It's, it's simple as straight. So I just want to know, as somebody who who graduated with um, a tutu, is it possible to to still try look for means of studying abroad? You know, just try to push because you mentioned one time your academic something. So I just want to know if if not to one and first class as tutu or anything lower. Is it possible to still look forward to, you know? Yeah. So thank you for this question. It is very, very possible to leave your country to study abroad with a lower degree, a two two or even third class. It's very possible. The only place that you can be having challenges is when it comes to scholarship. But if you are finding yourself in the United Kingdom, uh, you don't have any problem as long as you are the one that is funny. So a lot of universities in the United Kingdom accept to, to they will write it boldly on their website that if you have to to you can submit an application and they will give you admission. They don't have problem with giving admission when it comes to that in the United Kingdom. So where people might have issues is just the scholarship aspects. If you're applying for scholarship, a lot of scholarship will tell you that okay you need a good academic standing. While scholarship uh, that scholarship might focus on your leadership ability or some other aspect of your application in their holistic form. So you can apply to any universities in the United Kingdom with your tutu. You get admission, you find yourself, you meet yourself in the United Kingdom, no problem. All right, thank you very much. I think that's clear enough. Well, you're uh, my question is about your scholarship. Uh, I would like you to throw more light about how someone who already have a we already have admission to get scholarship. All right. Thank you. So generally in the United Kingdom, like I said, getting admission in the United Kingdom is quite easy. Like you can apply to five universities and all the five universities will give you admission. But when it comes to funding, that's where the problem comes in. I receive like DMs all the time that I just received one saying, he has admission in the UK, but he doesn't want to lose it. That is going to get scholarship. UK scholarship can be challenging. 
for admission there, you apply today, in next week they will give you admission easily. Why are you going to fund yourself? That's where the problem comes in. So the most common scholarship which I've mentioned in the United Kingdom are the Chevron Scholarship, the Commonwealth Scholarship, Rose Scholarship. So if you are applying to the UK, what I advise you to do is don't apply to university if you can't fund yourself. Don't apply to university if you can't sponsor yourself to go to that university, if you can't pay a lot of the tuition fee and everything. You only apply to university if the scholarship that you are applying to tells you to do so. So you don't, you don't just go there to apply to university. They will give you admission. But how do you get there without the fund, without all the money that you need to prove as a financial evidence? So when you want to study in the UK, you have to focus on scholarship, no admission. So when, okay. you, uh, when you see a scholarship like the Shevney Scholarship, they are going to tell you, you apply to this Shevney Scholarship, then you apply to the university of your choice. So you have to apply to a scholarship before you apply to the university. You know that university will give you admission. They give easily. But how are you going to fund yourself will not be through that same scholarship that you also applied to. So you only apply to university in the UK if you have the scholarship that you're also applying to at the same time. So if I, uh, as I already have an admission, I cannot apply for scholarship. Or I can if the apply. university If the university have a scholarship, check the university website. If the university have a scholarship for the program that you want to study for Nigerians or for, from the countries that you are coming from, Go there, go to their financial aid page. If you see one, apply to it. But in most cases, all those scholarships within university, they are mostly limited, just like £4,000, £5,000, £10,000. So if you see a scholarship within that university, you can apply to it. If not, you can look for fully funded scholarship by governments in the United Kingdom, then you apply to it. Like I said, the Sheldon Scholarship has closed last year. So if you want to apply to them, you have to wait till the application opens again. Then you can use the admission that you have to apply to that scholarships and then you get it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Please go ahead and speak. Yeah, all right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, am I, are there lines you just like uh, seeking your advice from your experience? Well, so I've applied to several schools. And I've, there are two schools. I've got to the mission of many schools. I think there are five now. So. So, but there are two schools in particular that I'm considering. The first one, the total tuition is like two thousand five hundred pounds, but the initial deposit is five thousand pounds, and the ranking of the school is like uh, eighteen out of four hundred twenty or so in the world. And then, okay, but the second school is um twenty three thousand pounds, but the offer grant of two thousand pounds. So that's like a two thousand that you show and their initial deposit is two thousand pounds so that means if i pay two thousand pounds from here i have nineteen thousand pounds to complete but the first one i said is five thousand five hundred pounds as initial deposit and the total to show like ten thousand five hundred or so so if that means if i get there i have like ten thousand pounds to pay so i'm like wondering that which is easier which would you suggest that the better option between the two because getting the funds trying to convert it to buy and everything is being is becoming very difficult because by the time I was doing all the calculation that I will probably I have to end up spending like 10 million if I can pick the country or something. So that's just my question. Thank you. All right. So in most cases uh as in as the United Kingdom and the fund is your most of most of the things that you are concerned about. The fund is what you are concerned about. I would just advise you to go to university with lesser fund for you to pay. So you go to a cheaper university, but you definitely need to make sure that you can even pay for all the tuition fee for that one year of tuition fee. As you have to show the financial evidence before you leave the country. So you need to be able to make sure that you can pay it before you get to the country. So it's better you just go to a university with a cheaper uh, tuition fee for you to pay. Okay, don't translate. All right. My question is, is there any scholarship for undergraduate? Okay, yeah. <laughs> undergraduate scholarship in the UK might be a little bit challenging because there are a few bachelor scholarship in the uk but there are still some 
like the University of Leicester has undergraduate scholarship. Well, all those scholarships have more like presidential scholarship for incoming undergraduate students. So you can look for the university that you're applying to, check their page to see if they have scholarship, full funding scholarship for incoming students. And that's that, right? Yeah, University of Leicester. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I need that from one of my junior, but that's what I'm trying to ask. Okay. But mostly United States has uh, far more scholarship, far more funding for undergraduates than the United Kingdom. So you can also consider that as well. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, I was going to ask um, how undergraduate is for, um, scholarship is for um, early years undergraduates in the UK. If um, if it is really based on one's academic capability or it is based on luck or other parameters. Okay, so for undergraduate scholarships, yeah. Most scholarships in most cases will look at your academic achievements. Your academic performance is very, very important. Like even in Nigeria or in any other country where you want to get an admission to a university, they will be requesting at least six, six in all your mathematics, English, and other. So in the general sense of, of it, all the university looks academic achievement mostly. They look at right. academic achievement mostly. So it's not by luck, it's just by what you've been able to achieve with your academic profile. They will check your future ambition also. Your statement of purpose will, might also be a determining factor. So it's not luck. But the first thing right. they check is uh, hey, the course that you want to do, then how are you able to how are you able to rationalize the course that you want to do based on the future ambition that you specified for them? So if you're able to bring the two together, your course of study and your future ambition, you align together and you're able to impress the admission committee, then you have a strong academic profile to back it up. Automatically, you know that you have a strong chance of getting an admission or and with a scholarship that is fully funded. So if you're able to do that three. You know that luck is not even in place for it again. You get based on your merit. All right. So as as a hundred level student now in, in Nigeria University, I can still go ahead and uh, make applications. Yeah, yeah, you can. You can go ahead and make applications for your undergraduate study. There are a lot of universities that does transfer, so you can transfer from Nigeria to the United Kingdom. But you need to send an email to their undergraduate admission office. Then they will be the one to tell you the directives of doing it based on that university because a lot of universities have their own different directives for transfer students in the United Kingdom. So you have to send an email to them and they will send you the procedures that you're going to follow to transfer your grace from Nigeria to their university. All right, host. That will be all from my side. Thank you very much. No, no, you're welcome. So I have Nancy. Okay, and um, please, I wanted to find out if the fees, does it include the house then, or when you get there, you have to um, pay for the house then as well? So when you're approving your proof of fund, you need to be able to prove that you have enough money with you that you used to find as when you get to the United Kingdom. So you be, once you're able to prove it, when you get there, you sort your servers with accommodation. But a lot of people actually find accommodation while they are in their own country. They connect with peoples that are there, then they will help them to, you just have to be, make sure that you trust those people that you are connecting with. And once you're able to do that, they will find accommodation for you and all that. Once you get to United Kingdom, you go to that place directly. So when you are going, you need to be able to prove that you have a, you have funding for your accommodation when you get to the United Kingdom. So you prove all that in your proof of fund. Okay, thank you very much. We have Dr. John. Well, oh. all right, good afternoon. Thank you for for this opportunity. I joined lately, but I am, my question is this. I have tried uh, applying for some master's program, both in the UK and uh, in the U.S. But it seems most of the time I just search online for those programs and midway, I get a loss. Now, one of the challenges has been that uh, as regarding our trust rates, the one we receive in 
the injury ahead. Most of the transcripts now, it's been requested that the school will send the transcript directly to the school you are applying to. So some of us don't have a, a copy of the transcript. I don't know if there is, if you could give a counsel towards that, or if there is an alternative, because it's as if you cannot uh, make any application without uh, having a transcript. So please, that is why I said, let me ask this. Thank you. So your challenge is with transcripts, right? Yes. You don't have your transcript? I don't. <laughs> you need your transcript. If the village didn't say that the transcript will be sent to the school you're applying to. Oh, okay. So if you're applying to schools in United Kingdom, uh, United States, some of them will request that the trans your transcript should be sent directly to their mail address. You send it physically. Your university will send it to their own university. But in United Kingdom, you don't have to do that. You can just upload your transcripts uh, through their online application page. So in the United States that you apply to, if you see a university that said that you have to send your transcript and you don't have any avenue to do so, you just look for another university that will allow you to upload your transcripts to their uh, online application page. There are a lot of other universities in the United States that will allow you to do that. So if there is no way you can send your transcript based on the financial aspect of it because it's expensive to send your transcript to the United States. Just look for another university that will allow you to upload your transcript remotely, then you do it. And if you don't have your transcripts with you physically, you have to, there's a way that you can request your transcript. You request for it from your university, then you send it to more like another university within your country is that you know someone there. Then you go there, you connect your physical transcript. I think that's what people do. So have their normal official transcripts with them. But a lot of universities also will tell you that you can submit an application even with your unofficial transcript. So you can just go to your your portal, your university portal where you check your results. You download all your results from the portal. You'll be using it as an unofficial transcript. A lot of universities accept that a lot. Like almost all university has of that. So once you have your unofficial transcript, you use it to apply. Immediately you get an admission, and hopefully if the admission comes with funding, you'll be able to find a few amount of money to request for your for your transcripts from that university, from your university, and the university will have to send it to the university that you gain admission to. So you can do that one as well. So you can use your unofficial transcript to apply for admission and gain scholarship. Wow, that's that's so beautiful. Thank you for this. It's a very useful information. Yeah, well, I, hope, I, I think I'd followed you. I can seek for more counsel, but I really appreciate this. No problem. No problem. So I have Rafael. Please, um, please, I wanted to ask a question concerning the scholarship. That is it possible to to gain a scholarship um, with a grade point of uh, below GPA below two point two, and also with the UK schools. Is it always the case that um, before admission, you make payments for your fees? Like you make payment after you've been given admission. You make a deposit in UK school. They will send you the deposit that you have to make. Some university, £2,000, £3,000, depending on the university. Once they've given you an admission, they will expect you to pay a deposit. I explained the reason why they want you to pay the deposit earlier. So they want you to pay that, uh, that deposit to know that, okay, you are serious about that university and you want to come there. Okay. So uh, are there some universities which are actually accepting low deposit funds? Yeah, yeah. I have a, a list of universities that accept low deposit, like £500, £1,000. Let me see if I can find it and attach it to this space. Okay. Yes, I, I just attached it. Yeah, I'm saying University of Birkbeck, just 200 pounds. University of Edinburgh, 500 to 1,500 pounds. University of Dundee, 1,000 pounds. So this gives us low deposits. Wow, wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. Um, please, I want to ask, um, my question is, Recently, we've been getting some uh, information 
about the UK to study visa read um um to study visa reduction period. I want to add if it, it is um, true it, uh, if it has been passed to law um, that UK post study visa will now be six months instead of uh, two years for uh, a master degree program. That's my first question, please. So as long as the UK government hasn't given any such information on their website pertaining to that, the information is still on their website is two years for a postgraduate course and three years for PhD, if you finish PhD. So that's the information that you should be following no matter what. That's what you have on their website and that's what you'll be following and that's what they are doing. So any information pertaining to that is irrelevant as long as it's not on their official page, the government official page. Okay. Uh, secondly, my question is, I've applied for nearly about um, 13 to 15 schools in the UK um four three to four has given me admission has offered me a con given me a conditional offer um i'm still hoping for others to come uh, i applied since last year but they're quite slow with um i've not seen much of the emails from the various schools i've applied i do not know why the delay um what can i do to find out the reason for the delay it's only because an admission in three universities yes so what other information are you waiting for there? No, 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 for, for others so that I can make my, my, I can make an informed decision as to the school I, I want to go okay. based on the indices of, um, this, the, the, the fund, the scholarship that will be giving, I'll be giving the, and other little, little from the conditions, from the offer, I'll be able to make an informed decision. So I want to know why are those other schools? University of Birmingham, University of um, Teesside, um, some other schools that I've applied for, you know, they've not come up with their admissions yet, their offers yet. So I'm worried for September anyway. So will I, am I still hopeful that these submissions will come in? Or I don't know. What do you think I should do? Okay, you can always send them an email. You can only send them an email so for the status of your uh, status of your admission. They will reply you always. For example, the University of University College of Birmingham uh, admission at ucb dot uk. You can you see their email on their website. Just send them an email. I can send you a draft of the email that you can send to them. Send them the email. How would that? They will let you know when your application, when the status of your application will be updated. Okay. Um, hello. I'll, I'll, okay. I will attach, I will, I will make a tweet about the sample email so you can copy it and use it to draft your own to send it to them. And I don't really have a question, but I have um, a little understanding about studying in the UK. And I know that sometimes you, you feel like, oh, you don't know like the process to apply for a school, but you can also use their own nigerian or the country's representative and they don't charge they don't charge anything because it's the school that pay them so i think that sometimes you'll be thinking oh i have to go to like if you want to apply to like 10 schools and you feel like you have to go to each and every website to check requirements sometimes going to like a representative of the of the schools representative either in nigeria or ghana or whatever can help you also you can use a an academy, you're not paying, all these things are free. If you're thinking you're paying, you're not paying, you're not paying. If you go to the school websites, you will even find it out from mm -hmm. them, who, do, who their trusted representative in your country is. Sometimes it's an academy, like an academy is different from like one representative. If you're using one representative, for example, it's that school's representative. Sometimes an academy works with the school, but also works with other schools. So when you go to an academy, maybe the place is in VI Lagos, for example, and you tell them, oh, I want to apply for schools. They will tell you how many schools they represent. Sometimes they will apply to like 10 schools immediately. So you are not applying to one, one, one. They will just tell you, bring this, 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 maybe your transcript, your reference. When you give it to them, they will apply on your behalf to all the schools that they represent. And then some of them will get back to you. That is what I used when I was applying for my school. Uh, I used an academy and they just applied to a bunch of schools and then 
some of them go back to me with like offer letters and everything. So if you think it's difficult to be doing each one, 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 you can just use an academy or you can use a representative. All right. Thank you so much for the contribution. So I think you all heard that. You can always use the registered agent, Maros University, is to submit your application. They will tell you all the process that you need to follow, all the document that you need to submit to make your application seamless. Thank you once again for the contribution. I wanted to ask something. So what the lady said is right. You can use some agents. And I held admissions from two um, universities in the UK. I applied with my degree and my HND. Okay. And then I have these agents also um, applying for universities for me. I got an admission. I got a conditional offer from the Birmingham University and some other university. And they are requesting for my trans, my HND transcripts. Okay. So I don't understand why is it that they are asking for my HND transcripts, but then the other schools like the University of Sussex and University of the West of Scotland, I have offers from them, but they never asked me for my HND transcripts. What transcript do you use to submit your application to those universities that doesn't request for HND transcripts? Okay, I I I submitted my degree transcripts, my degree certificate, and my HND certificates. They never asked for my HND transcripts. But then this other side, I submitted my degree certificate, my degree transcripts, and my HND certificates. I don't know why they are asking for, like, they are asking for the transcripts. The degree transcript that you submitted, how many years was it? The degree, um, two, oh no, three years, because I completed in 2020. But for the HND, I think I completed in 2017. So they use HND to apply to university to get the direct entry to university before you finish your degree? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, in Ghana here, I used my HND to apply for my degree. So I didn't start from level 100. I started from level 300 and then 400. But then they are asking for the transcript and they are saying that they want to see the courses I did. So in natural sense, your mm -hmm. HND is part of your degree. Yes. And so the yes. degree is more like As, top asking top. for your asking for your transcript of your HND is always normal because your degree your HND is part of your degree. You cannot have a degree of three years. That would be just that would just be an associate degree. It's not a full degree. A full degree has to be four years or more. So your old degree that you have, the transcript that you submit is just three years. Your HND transcript added to it will make it a complete degree. So you need to submit, you need to give them the HND transcript for them to fully evaluate your results, your, uh, your admission. Okay. Since, your, yeah, since your HND is part of your degree, so you just have to combine it together and submit it to them. It's normal. Okay, it's... okay but me, I'm just confused because... The offers I got from University of Sussex and then with the West of Scotland, they never asked for my transcripts. I'm wondering why some schools are asking and the other schools are not asking. Yeah. And they're all in the UK. Well, each university have their own different requirements. They have their own okay. admissions. Yeah, like I said, University of Edinburgh, if you graduated from it, like we graduated from Ghana, normally you don't have to submit an IESS or TOEFL. But University of Edinburgh, they don't care about any other country other than the UK. If you graduate from any other country other UK, you have to submit an IETS. Why a lot of universities in the same UK we tell you that if you graduate from Ghana, you don't need to submit IETS. So each university has their own requirements. Okay. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my question is uh, I've been able to secure two admissions, but I want to find out if there are any external scholarships. Because one, for example, the one, the 10 schools that you just said they are the cheapest deposit, the University of Glasgow, the tuition is £29,000. I want to find out if probably you have the external scholarship that one can apply for in the UK. And if you have any scholarships to one can apply for in Canada as well. Thank you. So for the UK, I just posted a scholarship that is 
are still ongoing. It just opened a few months ago. The great scholarship, you can check it. Check whether the university that you submitted an application to and the program that you want to do is under the list of that scholarship. The great scholarship, as in the great scholarship. Check it, it's still ongoing. And if that one doesn't work, that means you have to wait for some other scholarship in the United Kingdom, like the Shevney Scholarship or the Commonwealth Scholarship. If those one doesn't work, check the university. Look for the university, look for the scholarships that they have for international students. Then you can apply to them as well. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Now, what about Canada? What level is it, Masters or PhD? Masters. What's your undergraduate result? Is it okay? Is it like first class or strong to one? First class. So, there are a lot of scholarships in Canada that you can apply to. The first thing that you just need to do is find a supervisor that can. I was ready to take you. What course did you do? Is it a STEM course or a non STEM course? I, yeah, I did a STEM course. I did computer science. I asked computer science. It's a very competitive course, but there are a lot of scholarships for it in the Canada. So the first thing I just need to do, since the research is a research based course, you definitely need to find a supervisor. You can't go, you can't do it without it. I attended a, was one of their graduate open house. I already know that you need to have, you need to find a supervisor, but I still need to tell the woman that why does it have to be like that? That's, you just have to apply and sometimes and see whether they will have funding for you. What she said, what if you applied and then the, all the faculty members, they already have students in their laboratory and they don't need any other students. Are you going to go there? What are you, who are you going to work with? You can't do your research by yourself. So the first thing that you need to do is find a university that has a program that you want to do. Go to University of British Columbia, University of Alberta, University of Manitoba, all those universities in love computer science program. Go to their university page, check their faculty members, all the professors that they have, then find like two or three professors or assistant professor or associate professor. Those are the three people that you can send message to. Those are the ones that take students for admission. Those are the ones that do research. Professor, associate professor, or assistant professor. So send them an email that, okay, you have interest in joining their lab, you like, you've read their research paper, you like what they are doing, it aligns with your own research goal, your future research goal, your career interest. So you send them an email indicating interest in their lab, and then you pray that they get back to you that, okay, they have space for you. And once they get back to you, that you can, you can submit an application that they have space for you, then you submit your application to the university. So when you are submitting your application to the university, you indicate in your application, more like in your statement of purpose, that you've been able to identify professors and the professors told you to go ahead and submit your application. That is going to take you longer than then you submit your application. So the first step is to make sure you find the supervisor that is ready to take you. After that, everything will be easier. No, okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're yeah, welcome. All right, thank you so much all for joining. It will be organized on other space. So if you have any additional questions that I have an answer, comment on this space, comment on any of my posts, I'll get to it and answer your question. Thank you for joining. Bye bye. Yeah.